Committee will come to order without objection. The chair is authorized to declare a recess of the subcommittee at any time without objections. Members of the full committee not on this subcommittee are authorized to participate in today's hearing. With the hybrid format of this hearing, we have some members and witnesses participating in person and others on the WebEx platform. I would like to remind all members participating remotely to keep themselves muted when they are not being recognized. The staff have been instructed not to mute members except when a member is not being recognized and there is an inadvertent background noise. Members are also reminded that they may participate in one remote proceeding at a time. If you are if you are participating remotely today, please keep your camera on. If you choose to attend a different remote proceeding, please turn your camera off. The hearing is entitled, The Legacy of George Floyd, An Examination of Financial Services Industries Commitment to Economic and Racial Justice. I now recognize myself for four minutes to give an opening statement. Good afternoon. Americans of all races, white, black, young, and old, from the mailroom to the C-suites, were united and took to the streets to demand justice in an end to systemic racism that permeates many of our institutional institutions and corporations. The voices of the many resignated in boardrooms and C-suites as corporate leaders used the moment to empathize with the frustrations of protesters, their employees, and even stakeholders. George Floyd's murder was an indisputable example of systemic racism that shocked the conscience of the American public. Thus, today's hearing entitled, the legacy of George Floyd, an examination of financial services industry's commitments to economic and racial justice. The CEO of JP Morgan Chase, Jamie Dimon, said in weeks following George Floyd's death, we are watching, listening, and want every single one of you to know we are committed to fighting against racism and discrimination wherever and however it exists. CEO of Bank One of American, Brian Monahan, said in his testimony to the Senate Banking Committee May of 2021, his company hosted thousands of courageous conversations with their employees and social justice leaders to foster understanding and a common approach to addressing injustice. Leading banks and other financial institutions pledged to serve as allies and apply their power, their influence, and resources to support the fight for social justice and to invest in economic opportunities for black communities that have been redlined and shut out. This hearing comes 13 months following the death of George Floyd in the recent analysis by Creative Investment Research shows that United States corporations pledge $50 billion, including $33 billion from financial service companies. While pledges and platitudes that affirm values are important, we stand at a crossroad that demands tangible and transparent action. Today, I stand and urge my colleagues to join me in calling upon corporations to live up to your commitments, be intentional and implement sustainable practices that will permanently address the economic inequities that divide our nations. Transparency and accountability. You're gonna hear that a lot. Transparency and accountability must be at the heart of your commitments. And I call upon financial companies to fully embrace the spirit of my legislation, HR 2123, the Diversity and Inclusion Data and Accountability Transparency Act. 
and disclose their workforce and diversity and inclusion performance data to their OMWI directors annually. I call upon business leaders to join in the fight for social justice that impacts your workforce to champion diversity inclusion practices and to develop and leverage financial products and eliminate racial and gender wealth gaps. The financial services industry is a cornerstone of the American economy and workforce. So we wanna to hear today that you are going to be a part of the trajectory of future investment in the black and rural community. So let's bend the arc of justice by examining and committing to fully inclusive economic future. I look forward to hearing more from all of you. The chair now recognizes the ranking member for five minutes, Congresswoman Ann Wagner, my colleague and someone who has been with us from the very beginning of the Diversity and Inclusion Committee. I now recognize you for an opening statement. I uh, thank you, Madam Chairwoman, and uh, thank you to our witnesses for joining us today. Today, we'll be discussing how America's banks are taking positive steps toward a more inclusive banking system, the areas where banks can do more to support underserved communities and unbanked individuals, and how innovation and fintechs, such as Mr. Mia's firm PayBaby, can be a part, I think, of the solution. The members on this committee believe that all Americans should have access to financial institutions, financial firms, and the financial system to support and build economic prosperity. They should have the opportunity to save and invest for their family, for college, and for retirement. The subcommittee has examined and will continue to examine the strides that the financial services industry has made toward promoting diversity and inclusion and expanding banking services to historically underserved communities. America's banks and other organizations in the financial services industry promised to devote resources to advancing racial equity. Banks pledged billions of dollars to programs designed to close the wealth gap, drive home ownership, and bolster community development financial institutions, our CDFIs, and minority deposit, uh, depository institutions, MDIs. Banks have also been partnering with community organizations focused on racial equity, such as the Neighborhood Assistance Co uh, Corporation of America and the National Community Reinvestment Coalition. I want to list just a few of the noteworthy commitments from the financial services industry to increase banking services and better assist America's underserved communities. Now, Bank of America committed $1.25 billion over five years to advance racial equality and economic opportunity. As part of that effort, the bank announced in May 2021 that it would expand its national affordable homeownership program. The bank has made more than $350 million in investments, including equity investments in 40 minority-focused funds and 14 minority depository institutions and community development financial institutions. In 2021, Goldman Sachs announced 1 million black women, a $10 billion investment initiative focused on investing in black women to, quote, drive investment in housing, health care, access to capital, education, job creation, and workforce advancement, digital connectivity, and financial health. In 2020, J.P. Morgan announced a $30 billion over five-year commitment to racial equity. The commitment includes initiatives for affordable housing, small business expansion, and neighborhood development. In addition to these private sector commitments, Congress has provided $12 billion to community development financial institutions and minority depository institutions in the December Consolidated Appropriations Act for fiscal year 2021. I look forward to continuing to work with America's banks on these initiatives and am encouraged by the progress we have seen these past few years. I thank the chairwoman and I yield back. Thank you so much. 
Today, first, let me welcome all of our witnesses who are here today in person or remotely. First, we have remotely Mr. Fabrice Coles, Vice President of Government Affairs at the Bank Policy Institute. Welcome. Next, we have Mr. Donald Cravens, the Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer at the Ur National Urban League. Thank you. Remotely, we have Mr. Derek Hamilton, a professor of economics and urban policy with the New School, and I must certainly say this, and formally from my great state of Ohio at The Ohio State University. Welcome. Then we have Ms. John A. Holkins, Senior Director of the Policy at the Business Roundtable. Greetings. And finally, we have Mr. Hassan Mia, the exec Chief Executive Officer at Pay Baby. Welcome. Witnesses are reminded that their oral testimony will be limited to five minutes. You should be able to see a timer on your screen or on the desk in front of you that will indicate how much time you have left. When you have one minute remaining, a yellow light will appear. I would ask that you be mindful of the timer and when the red light appears to quickly wrap up your testimony so we can be respectful of both the other witnesses and the committee members time. Without objection, your written statement will be made part of the record. Mr. Coles, you are now recognized for five minutes to give an oral testimony. Mr. Coles is on the screen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Chairman Beatty, Ranking Member Wagner, and members of the subcommittee, thanks for having me today. I'm honored to appear before you. My name is Fabrice Coles. I'm a VP at the Bank Policy Institute, a nonpartisan public policy research and advocacy group. I appreciate the invitation to discuss the banking industry's efforts to help reduce racial inequality. Banks must be a part of the solution if there is to be improvement in outcomes for all communities, especially communities of color, many of whom have been left behind economically. Today, however, our focus is on banks' efforts to reduce inequality in black communities and how they're leveraging business models, networks, and resources to better serve them. I work directly with a group of executives responsible for this agenda at the banks and can share that this has been a time of purposeful action. Banks have decided strategies, agreed upon budgets, allocated resources, and built teams to execute on this agenda. Investments have been made, partnerships have been cemented, product innovation is ongoing, philanthropy is continuing. More than $50 billion has been committed. More than a billion of support and investment has already gone out the door. Progress has been made, but given the nature and residue of centuries of financial exclusion, much remains to be done. Racial equity gaps in income, health, education, housing, and wealth have proven intractable. But the events of 2020, the disproportionate impact of the pandemic on black communities, and the global response to the murder of George Floyd have spurred fresh thinking and action. Banks' actions to combat racial equity gaps include investments, partnerships, product innovation, and philanthropy. BPI member banks know that in order to address centuries of financial exclusion, they have to invest in people and organizations that are driving positive economic outcomes. They're making investments in community development and financial institutions and MDIs, supporting the next generation of black entrepreneurs and bolstering neighborhood revitalization efforts alongside black owned investment firms. They're investing debt and equity capital, but also sweat equity, working with partners to ensure that these investments bring shared prosperity. Lastly, banks are investing in the future of their own organizations, redoubling their efforts to recruit, retain, empower, and promote black talent, and working harder to ensure that the senior levels of their firms reflect America's diversity. Banks know that change involves investing time and resources with others. That's why banks are scaling impact by partnering with diverse organizations to hasten the delivery of support to black communities. They partner with federal regulators and state and local governments to promote new thinking about how to broaden access to banking services, credit, and jobs. They've worked with national organizations, providing affordable housing counseling and home purchase support. They've joined nonprofits to support policy research, provide technical assistance, and supply needed resources to minority-owned institutions. They partnered with HBCUs 
to invest in the future of financial services talent. And they've entered into joint ventures to execute billion dollar deals with black owned broker dealers and MDIs. These partnerships are complemented by a growing product portfolio. Banks have expanded their offerings of services and are increasing access to credit products for underserved or unbanked borrowers. The pandemic made clear the need for access to transaction accounts, especially as economic activity migrated online. And banks are offering more no fee, low minimum balance accounts to attract customers into the system. And then banks are deepening those new relationships by offering bridge, small dollar, small business, and special purpose credit loan options. Lastly, they're providing various forms of home buying support and exploring how fair AI can be used to reduce the cost of credit for borrowers that have been underserved in the past such as those with low or no credit scores. Bank strategies are executed thanks to the combined efforts of business and product units and affiliated philanthropic organizations to boost results and speed. Banks have committed billions of dollars in grants with fewer strings and with accelerated decision times for allocating philanthropic capital. This has all taken place across an expanded list of grantees and partners in areas such as small business, education, public health, social justice, and civil rights. In conclusion, when the world watched as George Floyd was murdered, we all stopped to consider what could be done to improve equity in our society. Banks were a part of that introspection, and in the years since that horrible tragedy, have rededicated their efforts to be drivers of brighter days ahead for all American communities. Accompanying my written testimony is a best practices document initially created for the banks in the midst of last summer's extraordinary public conversation about racial justice and released today for the first time. It gives a view into the seriousness of the tactical considerations underway at banks to support broad-based economic opportunity. An honest assessment of the foundation that has been laid leaves me with a parting thought. Much has been done. Sadly, much more is left to do. But I can say that I'm hopeful. Thank you, Madam Chair, for having me here today. I look forward to taking your questions. Thank you very much. Mr. Cravens, you are now recognized for five minutes to give an oral testimony on your presentation. Good afternoon, Chair Beatty, Ranking Member Wagner, and members of the committee. I am Don Cravens, Jr., and I serve as the Executive Vice President and the Chief Operating Officer of the National Urban League. On behalf of the entire Urban League movement, which consists of 91 affiliates in 36 states and the District of Columbia, I thank you for convening this hearing. Chair Beatty, I would be remiss if I did not offer my condolences to you and your family for your recent loss. I want you to know you have been in the prayers and the thoughts of the Urban League um, the entire time. Thank you. The National Urban League is a historic civil rights organization dedicated to economic empowerment, equity, and social justice. Founded in 1910 as a result of the great migration of African Americans to the North, the Urban League collaborates at the national and the local levels with community leaders, policymakers, and corporate partners to elevate the standards of living for African Americans as well as other historically underserved groups. We do that by focusing really in two and four primary areas, education, health, jobs, and housing. Pertinent to the, this committee and the work that you do, the National Urban League has specific programs designed to foster financial literacy, home ownership, small business financing, and home foreclosure prevention. These programs and services touch nearly 2 million Americans each year. It is correct that after the killing of George Floyd and other incidents of racism, many financial institutions turn to the National Urban League and others and our network of affiliates to address issues related to systemic discrimination and inequities. For some of these financial institutions, this was a continuation of the support for the work we've been doing and based upon previous longstanding relationships. For others, this was the beginning of new partnerships. And although we are thanking, thankful, Madam Chair, for the commitments and are hopeful real impact will be made and felt in the communities we serve, what we are most hopeful about is that these commitments will symbolize the ending of corporate philanthropic redlining. The fact remains, there is still real work to be done, and the resources that have been pledged alone cannot remedy centuries of inequities and disparities. Research shows that despite significant economic progress over the past decades, African Americans experience far worse economic conditions than white Americans or the American population as a whole. African Americans experience recession-like conditions 
even when the, comp the, ec the economy is thriving for other Americans. The unemployment rate for African Americans has been and continues to be approximately twice the rate of white Americans. The typical African American household owns just 59 cents for every dollar a white household earns. The median wealth of African American, fam of African -American families is $17,000. And for white families, it's $171,000. Only 42% of African Americans own their homes compared to 73% of white families. African Americans struggle to obtain mortgages, consumer loans, and even credit cards. More than one in four African Americans do not have a credit score, do not have a credit score. And 17% do not have traditional bank accounts. Ranking member Wagner talked about, mentioned some of these issues. So how did America get here? How did America get here? We got here because African Americans were excluded from the agricultural revolution due to enslavement and excluded from the prosperity of the last century due to disenfranchisement and Jim Crow legal discrimination. When you add those discriminatory practices to the mass incarceration of African Americans that followed, it is very clear how America has gotten here and why we have this persistent wealth gap. So what does real a real commitment to equity look like. Equity cannot be fully achieved by financial institutions simply donating money to external partners and relying on us to change the world, the minds and the hearts of America. Financial institutions must also look inward and ensure their own systems create inclusive places and places with which to do business. This is not only the morally right thing to do, but it's also good for business. I am proud to say that some institutions have retained the National Urban League for internal, un internal unconscious bias training or to provide supplier diversity training. Our message to our corporate clients is simple. If you want real change, if you desire a real commitment to equity, then you must be transparent and be willing to set an example. Otherwise, you're only partially committed to equity, you're window dressing. So when it comes to economics and the work of financial institutions, there is much work to be done, Madam Chair. The organizations best suited to assist financial institutions with addressing these issues, we've traditionally been underfunded, um, but the commitments are a start. However, none of, no, none of our organizations can make these changes alone. It will require government and our financial institutions and our nonprofit organizations working together. So again, thank you for, your t for, for allowing me to be here today, Madam Chair and committee members, and allowing me to testify on this very important subject. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Cravens. Mr. Hamilton, you are now recognized for five minutes to give an oral presentation on your testimony. And he is on this screen. Thank you, Chairwoman. Please. Thank you, Chairwoman, Chairwoman Betty, and uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Ranking Member Wagner, other esteemed members of the subcommittee. And I too wanna to offer my heartfelt condolences as well as gratitude for everything that you do, Madam Chair. Um, I am Derek Hamilton, Henry Cohen Professor of Economics and Urban Policy and University Professor at the New School and the Director of the Institute on Race and Political Economy. The fact that George Floyd could be killed in broad daylight by law enforcement for over an eight minute period with a knee in his neck while screaming for mercy that he couldn't breathe, it has to be the result of a devaluation of his life because he's black. After repeated examples of similar killings, this is vivid and should at least by now be undisputed. The immoral devaluation of black lives has been ingrained in America's political economy and it's long overdue for reckoning. So as a nation, are we finally ready to reverse our enduring and immoral blight of racism and redefine economic good to embrace the principles of morality humanity, sustainability, and provide a patriotic pathway to promote our shared prosperity and achieve racial economic justice. Government has a fiduciary responsibility to facilitate inclusion, civic engagement, social equity for all its people. All policies and government actions are rooted in norms, especially those related to production, transaction, and distributions. Government should promote diversity and inclusion and belonging in all aspects of civic and political economy, simply because it is just and the right thing to do. To achieve this, we need a deeper understanding of how devaluing individuals based on identities like race, gender, and sexual orientation, how they relate to political notions of who's deserving and who's undeserving, 
This is essential to expand our knowledge beyond conceptions of individual transactions into workings of larger political economy structures that affect us all. Our current economic system is founded upon the values of self-interested accumulation without bounds. Uh, but our economy should be grounded in different values, values of economic inclusion, civic engagement, social equity, human dignity, sustainability, and shared prosperity. Our enormous and persistent racial wealth gap is an implicit measure of our race's past, a past rooted in a history in which white Americans have been privileged by government, political, and economic interventions that afforded them access to resources and an iterative intergenerational accumulation associated with those resources. This is in contrast to a history for Blacks and Indigenous Americans where their personhood and whatever capital they may have established has always been vulnerable to exploitation and extrapolation by state complicit confiscation, destruction, fraud, terror, theft, and other acts of violence. Still, much of the framing around the racial wealth gap focuses on poor financial choices and decisions on the part of largely Black, Latinx, and poor borrowers. That framing is wrong. The directional emphasis is wrong. It is more likely that meager economic circumstance, not poor decision-making or deficient knowledge, constrains choice itself and leaves poor borrowers with little to no financial options but to attain and use predatory and abusive financial services. Households with few assets and low incomes are compelled to turn to high cost, unconventional alternative financial products. They generally are aware that these products are predatory, but they have no alternatives. These last resort debt traps render recipients indentured borrowers, having to pay higher and higher interest rates and fees until ultimately they default on the original principle. Racial inequality and despair are not inevitable. Rather, they are the result of political choices. Likewise, we can make different political choices. Congress needs to provide public options, options that directly compete with and crowd out inferior private options, private options that do not ensure universal and quality access to health care, housing, schooling, financial services, capital, and the free mobility throughout society without the psychological and physical threat of detention or bodily harm at the hands of a state-sanctioned terror because someone's identity is linked to a vulnerable or stigmatized group. Inequality is not rooted in deficient people, but rather deficient resources and power allocations. Let's change this paradigm. Let's be bold. Let's advocate for programs and initiatives that truly empower people with economic security, dignity, and authentic agency to define and achieve their goals. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Hamilton. Mrs. Hokins, you are now recognized for five minutes to give an oral presentation on your testimony. Good afternoon, Chairwoman Waters, Chairwoman Beatty, Chairwoman Wagner, and members of the House Financial Services Committee on Diversity and Inclusion. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today and for holding this hearing. Business Roundtable is an association of, of over 230 CEOs of America's leading companies working to promote a thriving U.S. economy and to expand opportunity for all Americans. In my role, I am responsible for overseeing the racial equity and justice agenda. Just a few months ago, during one of the greatest tests on our democracy, I was serving as Judiciary Counsel for Congressman David Cicilline. Prior to that, I was a litigation, a, a senior litigation associate at a DC law firm representing community health centers and other federal grantees and safety net providers across the country. I joined Business Roundtable in April because I believe that the CEO's commitments to ensure that the business community is doing their part um, to solve the racial wealth gap is necessary and important. 2020 was a year of reckoning for America. In response to the murder of George Floyd, Business Roundtable CEOs released a set of policing reform principles and has continued to press publicly for bipartisan policing reform legislation. Our members then turned to the, an issue central to equity in our economy, the racial wealth gap. 
That gap is a product of hundreds of years of policies and practices that have denied economic opportunity to black Americans, despite our many contributions. With humility, Business Roundtable engaged in hundreds of conversations with social justice experts, including fellow panelist Derek Hamilton, as well as Mark Moriel and Cy Richardson at the National Urban League. That process was focused on gathering information with the goal of driving support toward areas where the research and the data showed it mattered most. On October 15, 2020, this process culminated in the special committee's release of a set of corporate actions and public policy recommendations focused on six key areas, employment, finance, education, housing, health, and justice. As a CEO organization that represent, represents almost all sectors of the economy, Business Roundtable is uniquely positioned to bring about real change for communities of color and really work toward advancing racial equity. And our member companies are doing just that. For example, over the past year, PayPal has invested $510 million toward equity um, in inclusion and social justice causes. This includes $15 million in PayPal empowerment grants that were distributed directly to approximately 1,400 Black-owned businesses, many of which were also operated by Black women. Prudential made $10 million contribution to remove barriers to financial wellness in underserved markets. Cummins deployed $3 million to CDFIs, the NAACP, and SCORE to support Black-owned enterprises in Indiana, Minnesota, and Tennessee. Duke Energy deposited $5 million into Optus Bank, a Black-owned bank in South Carolina. Bank of America made more than $350 million in various investments across its primary focus areas of health, jobs, affordable housing, and small businesses. Our member companies are also committed to increasing diversity and inclusion in their workplaces from the top down. Business Roundtable announced a multi-year effort to reform their hiring and talent management practices and address inequities in employment practices. We know that there's a long way to go on this. These are just a few of the many examples of our member companies that have made good on their promises. One year of work cannot undo the centuries of harm done to black Americans and other people of color. There is so much more that needs to be done to address racial, the racial wealth gap and other inequities faced by communities of color. We are committed, I am committed, to making real progress and welcome the partnership of this committee to advance our shared goal of securing equity and opportunities for all Americans. Thank you for the opportunity to serve as a witness before the subcommittee. I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Mrs. Hokins. And now, Mr. Mia, you are recognized for five minutes to give an oral presentation on your testimony. Mm, it's red, is it? Oh, okay. <laughs> thank, thank you uh, for the invitation. My name is uh, Hassan Mia. I am the CEO and founder of PayBaby Corp. We are a financial technology company or a fintech focused on the empowerment of the black and brown community. I started the company and was founded in August of 2020 in wake of the death of George Floyd. It, that deeply affected me. So uh, PayBaby, we are the only black owned company that offers a FDIC insured a mobile bank account where it's possible to get a free bank account in less than five minutes. Over the past few months, we met with several of the largest banks, including the largest black owned banks in the country. Our observations include the following. Major banks have announced large financial commitments to the black community and black banks have announced investments from the big banks. This is to be applauded. However, the scale of the announced commitments appears to be larger than the actual investments. Uh, the evidence is still a little sparse on the announced commitments have resulted in the incremental support needed for the black community. The biggest concern is the lack of uh, what we call in the private sector KPIs or uh, key performance indicators that show accountability of announcement to results. 
Also, the approach and types of commitments taken by the banking industry uh, may not make the, the material distance, uh, difference unless expanded. The financial services industry includes the private equity and venture capital industries that account for a large share of the capital used to finance businesses and support financial inclusion, inclusion and economic empowerment in the black community. According to recent reports, black entrepreneurs only receive about 1% of all private equity and venture capital. This has not changed much. The, the VC industry has, however, made several investments in the last year supporting new uh, black founder funds, which is great. However, the scale still appears to be minuscule relative to the industry and not of any major material significance. Private equity and venture capital backed FinTech is the fastest growing category of alternative banking and lending in this country. Many of these uh, non-minority banks or FinTechs target the black community, but their business models are not designed to support racial equity and often result in more income and wealth extraction from the community. For example, just one small example, Tax advantaged private equity firms are now making investments and buying residential houses to be made available to rent. This could potentially crowd out the supply of housing and reduce opportunity for, for the black community to achieve home ownership, the biggest contributor to wealth creation. Black equity receives, private equity receives a large, its largest share of capital from government and private pension funds of which the black community is a capital supplier. Therefore, the lack of investment in black businesses and black entrepreneurs actually results in the transfer of wealth from the black community to other communities. This, the approach taken by banks and corporations to support black banks and MBIs can only have limited impact. Black MBIs total aggregated assets is approximately $10 billion compared to total US banking assets of 20 trillion dollars. Given the limited size and smaller geographic focus, they are simply incapable of addressing the racial equity gaps. FinTechs, however, are creating a transformation of banking and financial services. And similar to the other industries, tech-driven companies are designed to scale and efficiently build new models to support the market. Traditional companies and banks generally do not have those skills to make those kind of change to a tech-driven economy. And therefore, also many of these small community banks are adding FinTechs on top, but none of them are, are Black-owned banks. Therefore, they're not part of it. For the, for the banking industry, the keys to closing the racial uh, wealth gap and supporting racial equity is greater direct investment, recirculation of capital, and reduction of excessive banking costs. The spending power of the black community is over $1.3 trillion and approximately $4 trillion from the black and brown community. Yet only 2% of that capital is recirculated. Yet uh, outside the U.S., there, where large, formerly, formerly poor nations are gaining access to banking, new KYC and alternative credit scoring systems are being developed that are reliable as anything in the U.S. Yet this does not exist here, and the black and brown communities continue to stagnate. Actually, the racial wealth gap is still increasing. Thank you for inviting me here, and I appreciate your time. Thank you. And thank you so much for your testimony. I'm pleased to share with us that we have been joined by the chairwoman of the Financial Services Committee. In addition to that, she is the leader and actually the founder of the Diversity and Inclusion Subcommittee under Financial Services. It gives me great honor to yield the floor to Congresswoman Maxine Waters. Wow, thank you very much, uh, Congresswoman Beatty, for holding this hearing. And thank you for inviting the witnesses uh, who have testified here today. Um, the information that they're sharing with us will be very helpful uh, in pursuing uh, the kind of justice and equity uh, that your subcommittee uh, is responsible for making happen. And of course, our overall financial services uh, committee um, it's pursuing. I will start with um, uh, Mr. Uh, Cravens. And um, 
Mr. Hamilton. After the deaths of George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, and Breonna Taylor last year, our country entered another period of racial reckoning and a national focus um, on the systems of injustice that have deprived Black Americans of basic human rights and equal opportunities, including opportunities to build wealth for hundreds of years as the American public turned their eye to corporate America and search for commitments to address racial injustice. Several financial institutions made promises to lend or provide billions of dollars toward capital for minority depository institutions and community development financial institutions, direct grants to black businesses, and charitable donations to organizations serving communities of color. Mr. Cravens and Mr. Hamilton, many of these institutions have been slow to follow through on their commitments. How can we uh, increase the disclosure that is necessary uh, to help hold public uh, companies accountable to the promises that they make? And what are the other ways that Congress can ensure that these priorities are not simply empty platitudes uh, that an institution's policies are not per per uh, perpetuating racism and inequality through its operations, products, and services? And how can we prevent companies from easily pulling back on their commitments based on changes within their organizations. I've heard a lot today that basically deals with some of these questions that I'm asking. Uh, let me just say, I know the work of the Urban League. And of course, I haven't been in you know, government for so many years, of course. I've worked closely with the Urban League and I understand uh, what your priorities are, what your mandates are and what you do. But we've had a lot of discussion here today, uh, particularly about the, well, major uh, companies in this country uh, that after these deaths that I alluded to made commitments, how do, we, how do we hold them to their promises? Madam Chair, I think today's hearing is a, is a very good start or a very good continuation. Uh, you and, and Chairwoman Beatty and, and the ranking members, because this is not a, a, a race thing, this is an American issue. I think by bringing attention to this issue, by bringing the companies here, by talking to the CEOs, and you raise a great point, uh, Madam Chair, it's not just the Fortune 100. I mean, these commitments were made by companies of all sides. And so we at the Urban League are, are very committed when, when, when companies have called us and, and said, hey, we want to be committed. How can we help? We have absolutely given them a road plan. Um, we've tried to help them design programs that would help them make changes in our communities. As I've said, we feel we've been underfunded and ignored for, 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 for decades. And so we will continue to work with them, but we're asking for this committee and, and the members of the Congress from both sides of the aisle to, to hold people accountable, to continue talking about this issue, continue having these hearings. Uh, Madam, ba Madam Chair Beatty, can we have this hearing a year from now? Can we have another hearing two years from now? Can we make sure, to your point, uh, Chairwoman Waters, that this is just not a flash in the pan, that this is just not window dressing, but this is indeed uh, a, an end, as I said in my testimony, to philanthropic redlining? Well, thank you so very much. I'm gonna turn to Ms. Uh, Hawkins. How is the business round table? So let me go to something that I think is a little bit uncomfortable. Uh, but we need to talk about it. Uh, Ms. Hawkins and Mr. Coles, my staff analysis indicates that at Business Roundtable, just three out of 25 um, board members are black, and there are zero black people at the executive vice president level and above. Bank Policy Institute has zero black people either on its board or within ex ex executive uh, vice president levels and above. Ms. Hopkins and Mr. Coles, how can you lead your members in racial equity initiatives when you do not have many diverse perspectives within your own organization to help drive this work? And what efforts have been made to ensure diversity and inclusion are part of your um, recruitment and retention strategies? This is very difficult. You know, being an African American in a situation where you have a responsibility to educate and lead others who are not. Uh, who have significant roles uh, in decision making. How do you do that? That's a very great question. <laughs> um, so yes, you're, you're right. We only have three members of the board that are black. Um, but you know, I think really the business roundtable 
and our member companies do take diversity and inclusion seriously. I know just in my short time at Business Roundtable that I feel heard and, and seen and listened to. And I do feel like uh, my perspective is valued. Um, I don't know that we would be here um, today, but for me, fighting for this opportunity. I think it's important that we are held accountable and that there's true transparency. You're way past your time, and your time I want to thank Ms. Beatty so very much. But now she's got something to take back and tell them what we ask, and let's get their response. Thank you very much. You're Absolutely, back. And, and thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, I now recognize the distinguished ranking member for five minutes of questions, Congresswoman Ann Wagner. I thank you, um, Madam Chairwoman. According to survey results from the FDIC's How America Banks, which was conducted in June of 2020, there are an estimated 5.4% of U.S. households that are unbanked, uh, meaning that no one in the household had a checking or savings account at a bank or credit union. This percentage represents approximately 7.1 million households. Mr. Mia. We know that minority communities are unbanked at a higher rate than their white counterparts. Data shows there are several correlating factors such as education status and geography, but a major factor is also household wealth. Unfortunately, being unbanked is also very expensive uh, because prepaid cards and check cashing services also come with high fees. How are you, sir, expanding access to affordable financial services so that expensive services don't further inhibit the ability to build wealth? Mr. Mia. Thank you for the question. Um, yes, now these new fintechs now have the ability to offer totally free banking accounts, such as ourselves, mobile banking accounts, where uh, it, you don't have to have the minimum uh, deposit requirements of a regular bank. In fact, we're working with two of the largest black banks in America to replace their existing uh, service with our, our banking service. So now that is uh, possible. I think uh, one thing that has to happen is there has to be more support for pushing that message out to the community so they realize that the market now provides solutions that didn't exist before. That's part of it. The other big part, if I may for a second, is in order to get a bank account, you need to pass something called KYC or know your customer. We have found that the black and brown and, and particularly and poor people, they pass KYC at about one third less the rate, simply because they don't have any type of credit file, they don't have the history, and therefore they don't uh, qualify. Yet, as I mentioned during my testimony, there is now alternative ways to qualify those people. And that's what we're focused on is bringing new technologies and data science to be able to bring people into the banking system on a free basis and get them out of these high cost services. Thank you, Mr. Mann. Mr. Coles, in your testimony, uh, you mentioned how banks are offering more services and expanding credit products for underserved borrowers. Can you go into a little further detail on these products and how they could benefit the 7.1 million unbanked U.S. households? Thank you, ranking member, uh, for the opportunity. Uh, banks are expanding their offerings of low fee and uh, no fee transaction accounts uh, that are attractive uh, to unbanked and underbanked consumers. Um, you know, some may know these accounts as bank on accounts. Um, they also don't have overdraft fees as well. Uh, and so they are definitely a powerful tool to help promote financial inclusion. This bank on designation, um, which is provided by the Centers for Financial Empowerment, helps bring those folks into the banking system. And then at that point, banks are going to be able to deepen their relationship with them, offering them more products. Um, and so, you know, this is something that a lot of banks are offering today. Um, I think it's close to 100 right now with significant footprint across the country. Uh, but certainly there's more, there's a long way to go here. Uh, but these investments are being made, Congresswoman, and we expect to see even more penetration in this regard. Because, frankly, during the pandemic, we've seen the need. Uh, we've seen the need. And, you know, this is something that banks are really focused on. And you're going to see a lot more of these bank on accounts being rolled out um, in near term. But you have a lot of ones in the pipeline and a lot being offered today in the marketplace. Um, so we think that's an attractive option, Congressman. Thank you. I appreciate it very much. One of the key reasons many of these households are unbanked is not having enough money required to open a bank account. 
However, the FDIC cited other reasons, including not trusting banks. Mr. Coles, how can banks create community partnerships that I think build trust um, <laughs> with unbanked households and foster those relationships? This is, a, this is an important question, ranking member, so thank you for bringing this up. Communicating with the customer is, is key, as in any other uh, business relationship. Uh, more communication is required to ensure that um, you know, borrowers are feeling comfortable with um, the financial institutions that they're engaging with. So more marketing, investments, more partnerships, as you indicated, with community groups that can help get the word out about the safety and the low cost attractiveness of these options, um, we think is going to help really help make a penetration here. Uh, but you know, again, this is another uh, aspect that needs more investment and attention, and it's receiving that. And I expect more here, Congressman. Thank you. I appreciate it. I've got more questions, but I do not have more time. So, uh, Lady Chairwoman, I, I, I yield back at this point. Thank you. Thank you, Madam uh, Ranking Member, and for your questions. Uh, I now recognize myself for five minutes of questions. Uh, I'm going to ask some yes and no questions so I can hopefully get through uh, a lot of questions. First, Ms. Holkins, 181 CEOs signed on to the Business Roundtable's purpose of a corporation that pledges to foster diversity and inclusion, dignity, and respect. Doesn't transparency and accountability around D&I build confidence that the CEOs and their companies are living up to that pledge, yes or no? Yes. Follow up, Mr. Coles, does the Bank Policy Institute believe that transparency and accountability, diversity and inclusion performance should be mandatory? No. Many of your members have endorsed mandatory disclosure of diversity data, but can you give us uh, some insight on why BPI opposes it? Uh, I wouldn't say that we oppose it, Congresswoman. Uh, BPI uh, generally doesn't support, um, I think, increased, I would say, regulatory reporting requirements. Uh, but there is a lot of transparency taking place, EEO1s with the EEOC, and also engagements with the offices of minority and women inclusion are underway. But we have recommended, and this was a report that I submitted, um, Congresswoman, that more transparency be a higher priority. And so I think this is a journey. I think you're gonna see a lot more of this. You have more institutions, for example, uh, that since 2019, when the committee began its diversity and inclusion data collection, um, have really promoted more of transparency, releasing EEO ones and providing that accountability. Um, it's absolutely important. And that's why we uh, put it in our best practices Report that we submitted to the committee, Congresswoman, and I believe that we're we're going on this journey. Thank you uh, for being transparent, Mr. Hamilton. Investors and stakeholders have increased demands for companies to conduct independent racial equity audits to ensure that they do not contribute to systemic racism and are committed to DNI. The nation's largest financial institutions, many of them are fighting these efforts. Do you support racial equity audits? And what do you think they tell us about the culture and commitment of corporations? Absolutely, I support them. And um, if we value something, then we should measure it and we should hold entities accountable like we do any aspect of any of government that we value. Thank you. Mr. Cravens, the National Urban League has issued a State of Black America report for some 44 years beyond making financial donations. What must corporate America do to eliminate systemic barriers that drive racial and gender wealth gaps? Well, Madam Chair, I think uh, Brother Hamilton talked about it. I think you have to be transparent. I think you have to be held accountable. I also think you have to look internally at the, at the men and women who are brought into the company to work on these issues. Uh, I've had a stint in corporate America as well, and I have been that African-American who has been part of those discussions. The African-American in the room cannot be the only person, person calling for diversity, equity, and inclusion. As I would tell my white brothers and sisters, hey, I need you to chime in as well. The company needs to hear it from you as well. The only other advice I would give as well is the men and women who are charged as that chief diversity officer, Madam Chair, they have to have a, a direct line of communication to the CEO of the company. They have to have a direct line in order for it to work. Thank you. Mr. Mia, your testimony, you highlighted private equity and venture capital backed FinTech is the fastest growing category in alternative banking and lending in the country. 
Yet less than 1% of venture capital investments go to black entrepreneurs. Should FinTech providers be regulated to increase transparency and accountability for their performance and practices? Um, I'm not sure they need to be regulated if that's the solution, but I think there should be more uh, transparency on what they're doing. And I think the regulators could do more to push uh, re banking regulations that support fintechs as a way to increase the uh, participation of the black community. Okay, for Mr. Hamilton or you, Mr. Mia, or Mr. Cravens or Ms. Holcomb, fintech is an important tool, but what are the best strategies to address financial services needs of consumers in the more than 1,100 banking deserts across the United States? Ultimately, we need public options. Ultimately, we need public banks. We need to set a floor to ensure that there's quality access um, available to anyone. Mm -hmm. If the private sector wants to exist, they can exist with a bottom floor provided by government. Okay. Um, Mr. Mayor, I have 10 seconds. I'll yield sure. it to you. I, I'm not sure you need uh, uh, public banks. I think everyone in America has a phone and all you really have to do is get everybody using their phone for all the power it has. And, and that's in, from the poorest to the richest in America. And you see that happening around the world. India, Africa, and everywhere. Thank you, and thank you to all the witnesses. My time has expired. Uh, the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Gonzalez, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you to our, our panel for uh, their testimonies and, and contributions here. Um, Mr. Mee, I want to focus uh, my questions on you. Uh, so I was on your website. It's a pretty amazing product, frankly. Uh, so FDIC insured account within five minutes, no service fees, no minimum requirements, no overdraft fees. Uh, it sounds like no ATM fees if in network. Um, how by virtue of being a FinTech and not having some of the cost structures of uh, physical banks, uh, are you able to deliver on, on that service, that level of service? Um, so a, a couple of things, being built from the ground up as a software company, we, we don't have the legacy problems of a, of a major bank. So that's one thing. The second thing is something happened after the last uh, financial collapse of 2009, it was the Durban Amendment, and small banks can offer fintechs the ability to collect a 1% merchant fee, which is almost double what Chase and the bigger banks over 10 billion offer. So with as little as uh, someone having our debit account and spending $800 a month, it's a profitable customer. Got and it. all they have to do is use the card. So that's why it's possible. Thank you for that. And then um, one of the biggest barriers that, that we know of in, in terms of getting folks uh, into the banking sector is a lack of trust. Uh, I think um, Ms. Wagner mentioned that. Uh, how does PayBaby solve that? How, how do you enable trust in, in the black and brown community? Uh, that, that's a great question. The one area that we have underinvested in this country is we still use legacy credit services. And we, even though we're a fintech, we sit on top of an FDIC bank. That's the structure of our, uh, of our market. And so we have to get our accounts approved by the underlying bank. We are pushing now for them to look at alternative scoring and KYC methods. And we are working with some of the best data scientists in the world, which is a big issue. And that's where we also need a African-American or a person of color perspective to change it, and then people will gain trust because they'll see they can get an account uh, and, using newer methods. What role do you see AI and machine learning playing in, in your ability to uh, serve your customers? Uh, uh, that's a huge part of what we're doing is AI and machine learning because, uh, again, uh, we model and looking at a, around the world, and many people who do not qualify for KYC, it's possible to find from their habits that they're very trustworthy. Uh, even though they never had an account because they go to the same ca check cash and they go to the same grocery store. You know who they are. It's just that their credentials don't match. But with AI, you can figure out who these people are and see that there, there's no uh, fraud and other types of risk. So if I heard you correctly, so with the power of AI and machine learning, you can look at alternative data sources and find ways to pass KYC. Yes, correct. And that, and I would say that is the biggest hurdle at the moment, the first hurdle. And then that hurdle extends itself to credit scoring, where there's alternative credit scoring methodologies to, that AI is now bringing to the fold. And some of the fast, in a couple of the uh, companies that have actually gone public, that's what they're doing. Uh, and some of the biggest ones actually 
they're using alternative, they're, they're funding or using private equity and off the balance sheet and AI because the banking regulators have been a little slow to adopt in the, these um, methodologies and approvals. Yeah, I appreciate you sharing that. I, I think in, in this committee, I, I think frankly, that's a, a big moment, what you just highlighted, because um, we know that AI and machine learning have an enormous potential. We spent a lot of time, I think rightly, uh, talking about whether these algorithms are gonna reinforce biases. But I think what you're suggesting is, hey, look, you know, we can do this in a way that's actually gonna be inclusive and gonna be additive uh, for, for our uh, communities. Uh, yes, actually AI and machine learning is sort of like the uh, COVID is nothing but biology. AI and machine learning is nothing but math and computers. It's the people who program them that decide. Yeah. So if we have the right people programming them, we can have a balanced perspective. Great, and then final question uh, with my final 30 seconds. I notice uh, you're gonna be offering cryptocurrency access uh, through, through the app. Uh, what role do you think cryptocurrencies can play in uh, achieving some of our uh, diversity uh, initiatives? Um, so uh, we already offer automatic savings and we've had a lot of demand for cryptocurrency and mo most banks are now looking into it, which is an alternative savings method. Our goal is to offer it but we're looking at ways to do it in a way that gives the proper controls and guide rails so people uh, you know, make it uh, use as a, a, a true investment product. Thank you, sir. I, I wish you the best of luck uh, yeah. because I, I think it's an awesome company uh, and I'm excited that you're doing it. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Gonzalez. The gentlewoman from Michigan, Ms. Tlaib, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. I appreciate it. Thank you all so much um, for being part of this panel. I, I want you all to know when I asked the CEOs of the six biggest banks in America if they knew what environmental racism was, none were very familiar with it at all. Uh, each one by one said they, I think the most that one said was they were vaguely familiar. Uh, environmental racism isn't an abstract concept. I've seen it firsthand growing up in Southwest Detroit. The Marathon Oil Refinery and the zip code of 48217, a predominantly black neighborhood, has directly contributed to one of the worst air qualities in the state of Michigan with high rates of asthma and cancer. And when I visit schools, Madam Chair, and I read to the third grade class, and they ask me what I do, I always start off and asking, well, how many in the class have asthma? And a third of the class will raise their hand. And I talk about the fact that I work really hard to try to get us clean air. You know, Congresswoman Chisholm, the first African-American woman ever elected to the United States Congress used to say, children can't learn if they are hungry. Well, I also believe that children can't learn if they can't breathe, especially breathe clean air. Uh, Mr. Hamilton, how has this kind of environmental racism contributed to the enormous racial wealth gap in our country? Uh, you know, I guess it would be part of a whole infrastructure by which uh, black people are structured in a way where they don't have access to the resources that can enrich their, their ability to accumulate. It, it's not coincidental uh, who has access to good air, good land. These are products of both political and economic capital by which uh, black people have not been afforded in United States history. Thank you. You know, Ms. Holkins, I don't know if you know, um, even though black folks, my black neighbors make up less than 15% of Michigan's total population, we saw higher rates of COVID related deaths because of pre-existing conditions in my community. And so we know that six members of the business roundtable who testified before our committee in May aren't familiar with the term environmental racism. So I'm a little disappointed and, and a bit angry and outraged that the CEOs of some of the largest corporations in the world aren't thinking about how their actions and the projects they finance may directly lead to increased pollution in frontline communities like mine. So Ms. Holcombs, do you think that the other 202 members of the Business Roundtable are familiar, familiar with the term environmental racism? Yes, they are, and, and the members of the Business Roundtable really do take seriously um, the effects of climate change on um, underserved populations, and in particular, communities of color. And so, yes, that is something that many of our members are aware of, um, and most certainly important um, for, for our membership. 
And Ms. Holkins, does the business roundtable plan to incorporate uh, environmental impacts and environmental racism, the actual term, as part of its members' commitments to racial equity in our country? I believe that's a very important um, thing that must be considered. Um, currently, that's not within our racial equity and justice um, purview, but I'm happy to take that back to my team and, and figure out how we can take into account environmental um, justice issues. I truly appreciate that because I truly believe it does directly impact economic opportunities like housing and healthcare. My colleagues discussed today the importance of building trust and ask how do we do it? I think it truly starts with actions rather than fancy press releases and trinkets of what we call community benefits in the lens of corporations. Uh, addressing racial equity truly means reversing decades of environmental racism in our country and halting the damage that is still ongoing today. And that's the challenge I leave you, Ms. Holkins, and the Mrs. Roundtable and its members today. And I'm here to help and be a partner in that effort. Thank you, and I yield. Thank you for your questions. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Timmons, for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, before I served in Congress, I started several successful small businesses. So I know from experience just how hard it can be to start a business. And as we all know, it has not gotten any easier over the last year. Small businesses like mine have borne the brunt of the economic pain inflicted by the pandemic. But even before the pandemic, business formation was lower than it should have been. From 2007 to 2019, applications to form businesses that would hire workers dropped by 16% over that 12 year period. And that was during a time of economic prosperity resulting from the regulatory and tax reforms that made America more competitive in the global economy. So it is imperative that this Congress pursues an economic agenda that does not just support small businesses already in existence, but creates an environment ideal for small business, small business formation. Throughout our country's history, small business formation and entrepreneurship has been the key to unlocking the American dream for millions upon millions of Americans. And we all know there will not be business formation without capital formation. Back in May, the Securities and Exchange Commission's Small Business Capital Formation Advisory Committee made two specific recommendations to Chair Gensler not simply to stimulate capital formation for new small businesses, but also to make it easier for women and minority founded enterprises to raise capital for their endeavors. The advisory committee noted that traditional institutional investors are known for pattern matching or making investment decisions that replicate patterns of who a successful entrepreneur has looked like in the past. But unfortunately, this often locks out women and minorities who are often different from traditionally successful entrepreneurs. The changes recommended by the advisory committee were number one, increasing the cap on the aggregate amount of capital contributions and uncalled committed capital from 10 million to $150 million. And number two, increasing the allowable number of investors or beneficial owners from 250 to 600 for qualifying venture capital funds. Following their recommendations, I am today introducing the Improving Capital Allocation for Newcomers Act of 2021 or the I Can Act, which would codify these recommendations. We all know capital is the lifeblood of all businesses, but especially so for small businesses in their formative stages. I hope that my colleagues on both sides of the aisle here in this committee will join me in supporting these recommendations, which will no doubt go a long way to supporting small businesses, especially those owned by women and minorities. Um, along those lines, uh, Mr. Mia, would you agree that access to capital for entrepreneurs is often the primary obstacle for business formation? And do you think that increasing the cap on capital contributions and the allowable number of investors in VC funds will help assist our minority communities and women entrepreneurs who admittedly have a harder time accessing capital and finding angel investors? Uh, yes, I would say that access to capital may be the single biggest uh, problem that they have. I think uh, going back to your trust question, I think many of them do not trust the financial uh, investors to give them capital, so they often don't apply. Uh, we were involved in PPP loans, and many of them don't even have the proper type of accounts or the accounting. So all these things combined together make it difficult uh, for them to uh, get access to capital. So it's giving greater access to capital and, and supplying them with the tools to be able to qualify to onboard them 
they're getting the capital so that they can be on the road to developing their business? Well, having experienced firsthand the the incredible number of banks that turned me down for loans, um, I uh, <laughs> really think that anything we can do to help uh, new entrepreneurs succeed is uh, a worthwhile endeavor. So I look forward to working with my colleagues on both sides of the aisle. And with that, um, I yield back. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your questions. The gentlewoman from Pennsylvania, Ms. Dean, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and thank you to all of our witnesses uh, for being here today and sharing your advice on this important set of topics. Uh, the death of George Floyd, as we all know, sparked a necessary conversation, uh, the need for meaningful reform that ensures true equality, justice for all. Uh, but I know we are all frustrated that conversation is simply not enough. So thank you to all of you for what you are doing to push these issues of justice and equality forward. Uh, I, I wanna take a look uh, at the injustices that exist and continue to affect the economic success of black Americans. We all know and recognize by this subcommittee's work that banks and financial institutions have a role to play. We all have been a part of passing, for example, the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act, and we continue to push for that in terms of justice in our policing. But on the financial institution side, uh, Mr. Cravens, uh, the National Urban League's work is well known and well renowned. At the end of your testimony, I was interested in something that you said, uh, that organizations best suited to assist financial institutions have traditionally been underfunded. Could you elaborate on who these organizations are uh, and how you are funded, how they are funded, and how do they specifically help financial institutions reach these platforms and recognitions of equity? Yes, thank you, Congresswoman, for the question. I, I was speaking about organizations like the National Urban League. We have been saying since 1910, we live in the communities uh, that are facing these inequities, these disparities. There's been a lot of talk today about trust, that people have to trust the banks in order to take advantage of all of these great services that banks may be offering. The National Urban League, the NAACP, many of the community organizations, many local organizations that I couldn't name today, those are the go-betweens. Those are the organizations that have been trying to do this work for decades, for centuries. And yet they've been doing it through government grants when the government gives those types of grants. They've been doing it through individual donation. I like to say they do it through blood and sweat equity. And when unfortunately something really terrible and something very unfortunate happens either nationally or in the community, Sometimes they get it, like we're seeing through the George Floyd, a situation where we're getting an outpouring of support. What I'm hoping, as I've said again, is that this is not the beginning or the flash in a pan of this giving. I think what, 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 what the unfortunate murder of George Floyd has shown, and, and has, we know and we all know that as leaders, is that we have a long way to go in this country. But if we're gonna be serious about it, let's really be serious about it. The Urban League has been calling congressmen for a Main Street Marshall Plan since the 1960s. We rebuilt Europe after World War II. We overinvested in Europe after World War II. We've never overinvested in our urban America. We've never overinvested in our own schools and our own roads. And as you debate an infrastructure plan, ladies and gentlemen, I ask you to just simply consider what would be the harm in actually giving a group of people who never had boots and never had straps, some bootstraps. I know I've heard several times, African-Americans, pull yourself up by the bootstraps. Still waiting for the boots and the straps in many of these communities. And these disparities you're pointing out, Congresswoman, they're a result of that systemic slavery, reconstruction, Jim Crow. I, I said this to a very dear white friend of mine the other day. African-Americans have never had the good old days. There's never been an, an age of innocence for African-Americans. What were our good old days? Reconstruction? And so we are still hoping to form this more perfect union that our forefathers talked about. We are still hoping that the good old days are to come. And so those are the types of organizations that Congressman, I believe, have been underfunded. We're hoping that this is the beginning and that this committee will continue this transparency and this accountability and we can make our country great for all Americans uh, with this new support. Also connected to your opening statement, uh, is the notion that we all have to be in this together, whether you're sitting in a C-suite or around any table or you're participating in a Black Lives Matter march and everything in between. Uh, that's what impressed me. Uh, I represent suburban Philadelphia, 
So you can picture those areas uh, where black, white, young, old, people of every color, ethnicity came together. That's when we know we will continue to make a difference. But it is frustrating because George Floyd, of course, uh, was heinously murdered. But we know in the time since his murder, hundreds of other men and women have been murdered by police, I guess not so uh, open and, and videotaped. Uh, so it's very frustrating. Can you maybe be mm, specific, maybe in suburban Philadelphia, I know I have 11 seconds left, how Ur the National Urban League could help us uh, make progress in these areas? Sure, the National Urban League, we, we've got 91 affiliates, Congresswoman, and they really do the, the, the heavy lifting. And I have to give credit, our affiliates are separate affiliates in their communities. They've got their own board of directors, their own full-time paid staff, and they really make the difference in, in the Urban League movement. They are the ones who do the housing counseling. We've, count, we've, we've counseled over 850,000 people on, on how to start new businesses. And so organizations like the Urban League, obviously I'm, I'm a little biased, but there are others as well uh, in the Latino community and, and all of our, our ethnic communities. They're doing, they're doing the real work. And how can we help? We can support them, we can bring attention to them, and we can encourage our financial, encourage our financial institutions to support them. I thank you, and thank you, Madam Chair. You're back. Thank you. Ranking Member Wagner, do you have any more uh, members uh, at this time? Not at this time, please proceed. Okay, thank you. Uh, the gentlewoman from Texas, Ms. Garcia, is now recognized for five minutes, but first let me say congratulations for being vice chair of this committee. Well, thank you, Madam Chair, and it's an honor to serve with you. And uh, thank you for putting together this very important hearing on such a important topic, uh, particularly uh, as was said earlier, as we approach um, certain anniversaries that are important on this topic. Uh, co my colleagues, I've, I've, you know, this Rachel Wealth Gap is is really not a new thing. It is it is longstanding. And it's unacceptable. And as the previous uh, uh, witness uh, just said, you know, there's never been a, a good old days. I mean, it's always been a struggle. Uh, so we must continue to fight hard uh, to level the playing field. And we need to go from the commitments that have been made uh, to real action uh, in closing that racial wealth gap. There are also inequities uh, with access to credit, especially a small business credit. Uh, here in Houston, my district is 77% Latino. We are the fastest growing market in the United States. The Department of Labor found that Spanish speaking Americans are expected to account for almost 65% of labor uh, force, for, force growth through 2029, adding 7 million new workers. And as consumers, Hispanics are the single largest and highest spending minority in the United States today. Yet many institutions from wealth managers to credit providers have not actively sought to reach this growing market. Minority depository institutions and community development financial institutions have been engaging with these markets for a while though, but they need our support. They have received financial support from the big banks recently. Uh, we wish they would do more, uh, which is great, uh, but we need to make real substantive changes to make sure uh, that we label that playing field. My question is both for Mr. Cravens and, and Mr. Coles. Uh, going beyond financial support, what was me do, must be done to increase the presence and strength of MDIs and DFIs? How can we help this industry grow and reach the markets that large banks fail to reach uh, among the people of color? Thank you, Congresswoman, um, for that question. Um, as a former employee of the CDFI fund, um, I, I thank you for your focus on this. Um, this is terribly important. Um, large banks have been supporting CDFIs and MDIs and partnering with them as well. Uh, not only support, but partnering um, on business activities. Um, but these are critical institutions. Um, you know, they're able to leverage the capital uh, to better serve these communities by statute. 60% um, of their activities, CDFIs, has to be in underserved communities. So as a delivery channel for support um, for financial inclusion, there might be no better silver bullet. Um, and so I was so pleased to see Congress act with $12 billion of capital support for these institutions um, in, the, in the recent uh, appropriations bill. Uh, I think as a matter of policy, uh, and VPI members have supported this, at minimum, a billion dollar budget for the CDFI fund would be a great start. 
um, including, you know, you know, more resources for technical assistance, more resources for uh, technology uh, transitions, um, and you know, better, <clears throat> excuse me, small business development support. Um, so these are critical channels for for relief and for uh, economic growth. And I'm so happy uh, to see this sector receiving the uh, attention that it has since last year. We certainly need to do more. As far over a billion dollars have been deployed. More is coming, Congresswoman. Well, thank you, Mr. Cravens. Congresswoman, I, I really don't have much to add. I, I think Mr. Coles hit the nail right on the head, which is we need more of those types of institutions. We, we would like the government to help make it easier, but obviously with, with the right regulations to ensure that those, those institutions are doing the jobs they do, but it goes back to trust. I think those organizations are community-based organizations uh, that people will trust. We, we, we have language barriers, we've got just racial barriers, and I think those organizations do a, could do a better job of actually getting to the hard to reach people, that persistent underbank that we're talking about. Right, and for both of you again, um, how can we really change, uh, move um, all of these commitments that so many are making uh, in the industry? Uh, many have made pledges and make commitments, but distribution of the funds require grants, they're multi-year commitments, so what are we get, what can we do to change it from commitment to real action uh, and real uh, uh, accountability uh, to ensure that that the dollars that are committed are actually will be spent? Yes, ma'am. Thank, thank you for that question. Um, you know, I'd say that by our accounts, you know, almost a billion dollars are already out the door. Uh, but with 50 billion committed, certainly there's a long way to go here. And I certainly recognize the need for speed here. And that's critical. Uh, but I think like any other institutions, you resource something, you budget it, you allocate resources to achieve a, a tactical objective, and that's underway. And I think the next time we meet, you're going to see a lot more here. And all I can tell you is I've spoken to a lot of the executives doing this work at the banks. Banks are hiring executives to do this work specifically. And they are engaging different community groups. They're engaging business partners to do this work. And so I understand the need for speed. Um, I can tell you that these things are happening. I've seen it. I've spoken to the people. Uh, and we're going to see a lot more much you know, sooner than we expect, Congresswoman. But I, I understand the urgency here. Um, and I think you're going to be pleased with the results over time. Right. The lady's time has expired. Thank you, Madam Chair. You Thank like. you. Thank you. The gentlewoman from Georgia, Ms. Williams, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. We have a lot of work to do when it comes to closing the racial wealth gap in this country and in my district, which unfortunately is at the bottom of the list for all cities. If we want to make significant progress on this issue, it's going to take both private industry and government making ambitious commitments. But even more importantly, it's going to take intentional implementation of steps to reach these commitments and consistent measurement and assessment of progress. Mr. Coles, can you tell me a little bit about your, uh, how your members are measuring progress toward the objectives that they've devised to address the racial wealth gap? And how will this measurement be used to inform their plans and actions going forward? Thank you, Congresswoman. Uh, I think the BPI members are uh, tracking according to a couple of different buckets, the number of CDFIs and MDIs they've invested in, um, small businesses that they've engaged, philanthropic commitments and disbursements that they've made. Um, and, you know, I think that these um, these are areas that uh, are, I think are also part of a journey. Uh, I think standardized uh, metrics uh, across the industry um, are certainly something that people are looking at. Um, and, you know, I think certainly there's a lot more to do here in terms of tracking and reporting, um, which is, again, a part of the reason why in our best practices report that we submitted to the committee, uh, we, 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 we highlighted that very thing. And so I think there's, a, there's, there's some ways to go here, Congresswoman, to uh, achieve what you're talking about, but it's important. The industry recognizes the need, and I think you're going to see a lot more here. So just to follow up on that um, and a couple of issues that I think are key to closing the racial wealth gap and identify how progress is measured. Mr. Coles, over the next year, what numeric milestones do you believe would represent sufficient progress towards your members' goals of helping more home buyers of color get their first home? And how will evolving data inform your members' approach to tackling this issue? 
Thank you, Congresswoman. I think, as was said earlier, you know, what gets measured gets done. And I think that when we see more mortgages created for black homeowners, more intentionality towards that, you're going to see that data improve. Um, so again, more investments in MDI, CDFIs, more investments directly in organizations promoting homeownership, providing direct grants for down payment assistance. These are things that are going to be helpful. And I think that when you look at the data, you're going to see a lot more people in homes uh, a year from today. Thank you. And so as I've explored in previous hearings that there are many racial disparities in the unbanked population, and we need to do everything that we can to address the underlying factors that inhibit access to basic financial services so that people of color can save and invest for their future. According to a 2019 FDIC survey, nearly half of the unbanked house households said that they didn't have enough money to even start a bank account. About one third of unbanked households cited both high bank fees and unpredictable bank fees as barriers to getting banked. Mr. Coles, you mentioned banks are expanding their offerings of no fee, low minimum balance accounts. What numeric impact do you anticipate that this change will have on reducing the unbanked and underbanked population? Thank you, Congresswoman. Um, I hesitate to make a prediction about kind of the numeric impact, but what I can say is that given the factors that you've indicated in that FDIC report that were articulated so well, uh, you know, I think that with the proper amount of marketing about the existence of these products to customers, I think we can see a significant dent um, in the millions that are unbanked and underbanked. Um, and that's in partnership with um, federal, state, and local governments. We're also joining the outreach and communication effort around these particular kinds of accounts. Um, and also, frankly, the marketplace. Uh, the marketplace is demanding that banks do more on this, and uh, you're seeing investments towards that effect. And you've seen more banks um, adding these accounts, um, you know, thanks in partnership with, like I said, uh, federal, state, and local governments um, and groups that we're working with. So um, a lot more to be done here, Congresswoman, but again, we're on the road. Well, Mr. Coles, how will your members use the trends in banking access data that is being collected to inform their future work and breaking down the barriers to banking? That data is in, very helpful to informing decision making um, and hopefully for those um, institutions that may be on the fence, they'll be able to use that data to see that um, these products drive uh, customer engagement um, and, and support. Um, and also have meaningful impacts on the communities that they're a part of. Um, so in addition to community impact, there's also going to be a positive business association with those accounts as well. And I think the data is going to demonstrate that to business decision makers uh, and make it a more pr attractive product, both to the customer, but also on the supply side, Congresswoman. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Mr. Coles and all of our other panelists today. And I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Achenklaus, for five minutes. Thank you, Chairwoman, for holding a hearing through this lens. In meetings with my constituents, I have stressed that the Diversity and Inclusion Subcommittee has pushed financial institutions to take a closer look at diversity within their company, their customer base, and their investments. In 2020, many financial institutions announced substantial investments in black communities. Bank of America pledged $1 billion over four years, Citibank $1 billion over three years, JP Morgan $30 billion over five years, and PayPal $510 million for small businesses. These investments are a start to actively engage with communities that historically were purposefully excluded from our economy. Uh, and in my home state of Massachusetts, housing has been a principal means uh, by which black Americans have been redlined from opportunity. Owning a home is the single greatest driver of wealth for most families across the country. Yet black home ownership is at its lowest level since the 1960s, effectively curbing the ability to raise generational wealth. Some of the banks have earmarked their investments specifically for increasing black home ownership. And building on the comments of my colleague from Georgia, uh, Mr. Coles, I'd like to ask you, how should banks measure their success in this arena, specifically for increasing black home ownership? What, what should they be doing differently to achieve their home ownership goals if they're not hitting the metrics they establish? Thank you, Congressman. Um, I think uh, what you're seeing is a lot of activity already to support home ownership. There are partnerships with um, uh, nonprofit groups to help provide uh, affordable housing counseling, but also direct financial support to help people get in homes. Things like helping people defray the cost of closing, things like uh, you know just general grants to help people provide down payments. Um, and so you know that that data is going to improve with more intentionality. 
And I really want to emphasize this point. Um, banks deploy capital. Banks lend to uh, borrowers who are looking to get into homes. Uh, you know, although a lot of that activity has migrated to the non-bank sector, but um, what you're seeing is intentional support for this activity by banks, both on their own and in partnership with other institutions. Mr. Coles, I appreciate that, but what you're describing are the means. And I, what I'm pushing for here is for an outcome as multi-threaded as home ownership, where there's a lot of things that contribute to, to home ownership, are there specific things that these major banks can be looking at to know that they're moving the needle? Uh, Congressman, you know, I'm happy to circle back with your office on metric specific analysis. Um, I don't have that before me today, but, you know, I think that generally, again, being intentional, uh, especially with financial support to help these borrowers uh, bridge that gap uh, to get themselves into homes, you will see more progress, sir. But happy to follow up directly to your question. I would appreciate your partnership on that front as this is a critical issue for our district and, and measuring it, I think, is going to be a big part of the solution. Uh, Mr. Cravens, I'd like to direct the second line of questioning with you. I was struck by an expression that you used, a Marshall Plan for Main Street. I love that expression. I may adopt it with your permission. Uh, I would posit that with the American Rescue Plan funds uh, in Massachusetts, $5 billion for states and cities, with the upcoming infrastructure bill that we will pass, billions more for transit, for complete streets, uh, we have a generational opportunity for a Marshall Plan for Main Street. In fact, we're doing it. Uh, with President Biden and with the Democratic Congress. Uh, are there areas that you would encourage states and cities in particular who are going to have a lot of the latitude in how to spend this money at the end of the day that they should be directing these investments into to accomplish uh, this, this Marshall Plan for Main Street? Thank you for the question, Congressman. I, I will say this about adopting the name. The Congressional Black Caucus has actually included the domestic Marshall Plan as the title piece of their Jobs and Justice Act that they've, they've introduced over the last two Congresses. So I would simply say you should sign on as a co-sponsor if they'll <laughs> let you and uh, support the bill. But um, thank you for, for that. Um, what I would suggest, Congressman, are a couple of things. I mean, I think the, the, the uh, Congress and the President, the administration, is absolutely considering some generational changes. Um, I, I think you know, Congressman, schools, um, access to broadband, access to, to, to technology would, would even those things. What I will say for this hearing and your, with your limited time though is this, whatever we do, can we ensure that African-American and minority owned businesses not only benefit from it as recipients, but they also benefit from it as delivery, as, as deliveries, of, as business people. We've not spent a whole lot of time on supplier diversity here today, but one way to really even things up and, and catch people up is to let African-American businesses participate and sell things and buy things and, and hire people. And so what I would suggest to you is that as we continue to build this infrastructure plan and what it will be, are we also making sure that black businesses and minority-owned businesses and women's, women-owned businesses will be able to participate? I appreciate that answer, and I'll yield back my time. Thank you for those questions. Ranking Member Wagner, uh, we have no more uh, questions. If you have no more questions... Uh, we do not, uh, well, Madam Chair, I just thank you for this uh, for this hearing today. And I will also but, want to express, I did you personally, our, my profound um, sadness for you, you and your family at your, your loss of your dear husband, Otto, and uh, you know that you are all always in our, our uh, thoughts and prayers. God bless you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Anne, and thank you to all of the witnesses and all of the members. Uh, I'd like to thank our witnesses for their testimony today, and without objection, our members will have five legislative days within, within which to submit additional written questions for the witnesses to the chair, which will be forwarded to the witnesses for their response. I'd ask our witnesses to please respond as promptly as you are able. Without objection, our members will have five legislative days within which to submit extraneous materials to the chair for inclusion in the record. I remind members that written questions and materials for the record should be submitted to the email address or provided to your offices. Without objection, I would like to enter statements to the record from the American Bankers Association, Color of Change, Financial Services Forum, and Securities Industries and Financial Markets, without objection. The hearing is now adjourned. <laughs>